Coming up on this episode of Learn From People Who Lived It. I should know how to be able to like <laughs> move myself past this moment, right? And not stay stuck here too long. Same question. Oh, I, I, I resonate with a lot of that, that kind of like, don't therapize me right now. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but 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 think for a minute. Can you? <laughs> um, so almost every week of my life for the last two years, somebody will ask me about the retreat that changed my life. And I'm so proud to present Spirit Quest as one of our official resource partners. Founded in 2007, it's the holistic wellness center that changed my life, helped me overcome anxiety, helped me work through conflict, uh, gave me all these tools to manage stress, and they would love to do the same thing for you. To connect to Spirit Quest, click the link on our resources tab at learnfrompeoplewholivedit.com. And when you get on the phone with them, make sure you mention that you heard it on Learn From People Who Lived It. Find Learn From People Who Lived It wherever you get podcasts. Search it using all one word. Learn from people who lived it. Welcome to another episode of Learn from People Who Lived It. Welcome to another episode of Learn from People Who Lived It. Look at this trio of people on the screen right now. Uh, You all know the gentleman in the red all the way to the right and Dr. Frank Bavacqua. And in the middle today with us is Karen Kondo. Hello to both of you. Hello. Hello. Frank, how you feeling, buddy? You doing okay over there? I know you've got the bun in the oven. Well, your wife does. Yeah. And, uh, you know, is it going all right? Yeah, pregnancy is hard, but I'm hanging yeah. in there. Thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you know anything about pregnancy, Karen? Uh, just a bit. Yes, I do. Uh, how, how many kids do you have? I have two adult children. What, what advice can you give Frank right out of the oh. gate? I know he's the psychologist, but what advice can you give him about uh, while she's pregnant, don't do blank? Oh, I just, I just gonna say, hang on, sweetie. Just hang on. <laughs> yeah. I've learned to not say no. Yeah. You yeah. No, you know, can we, you know, no ends in tears. So, yeah. you know, yes, yeah. the answer is yes to everything. What can I do for you today? Yeah. yeah, right. How old are your children now, Karen? My, can I ask? Uh, 25 and 28. Awesome. All right. Well, listen, oh, that's let's great. get I'm in. Done. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, on the total other side is where Frank is. Mine are 15 and 17, and so I'm somewhere happen. in the middle. Like, yeah. They, they will come out and grow up. <laughs> in the blink. Um, okay, so we know... Karen because of Jill McMahon who's been on the podcast several times and she has a knack for spotting somebody who's got a great story and I don't think this one is going to be any different in fact you know we learned from people who lived it kind of jumps out at people one of two ways it's either kind of this story about the first 10 years of people's life all the stuff that they went through how they overcame it or we bring people on as more of an expert and we say all right tell us what you know in your field but as you're going to understand today Today, this one's needs to be a hybrid of the two, a buffet of sorts, is I think what you guys said up front. And that's because, boy, from a very young age, you got a close look at the thing you went on to study, right? Correct. Yeah. Why don't you uh, give people a little illustration about that moment? Um, so when I was real, well, you know, you can go all the way back. I know sometimes you go back to zero to ten which is always fascinating. And I think narrative becomes important. So even back further than what brings me to my career was my mom was never supposed to have children. And so when she became pregnant with me, it was a big surprise. And then I was very premature and um, had a 50% chance of living. So I grew up with this story of survival that I survived, right? I wasn't supposed to. Um, It was kind of this miracle, if you will. Um, and then, so I've always kind of that narrative in my life was that I was a survivor. Well, my mom went on to have another child, our brother, Andrew, and we were only about two years apart. And unfortunately he died very early. He drowned when he was almost three and I was almost five. So, you know, and I had an older brother and sister who were adopted. So you, you, you know, I grew up in a grieving household. And this was back in the 70s, so life was a little different than it is now. Um, And I think that my mom did a great, my parents did a great job. We were part of the funeral. 
Um, you know, we were, they never hid, obviously they didn't hide the death, but they didn't, we, they talked about the death. We talked about Andrew. Um, it wasn't a secret in our family, uh, like sometimes death becomes and, uh, but it affects everybody, right? That kind of, that kind of event. It, how can it not? Um, and then when I went on to school, I quickly became involved in, um, a pediatric program called Child Life which helps children um, in pediatrics that are being hospitalized. And that was my first career. So obviously helping people at difficult times, you know, started for me at a really young age. We have that in common, Karen. I was a child life intern at the Kansas you City Chil- yeah, at the Kansas City Children's Hospital back in like uh, early 2000s or something like that. Yeah, oh, I worked awesome. as an intern in the burn unit. That's awesome. It's not yeah. a well-known um, career path. But it's an amazing um, it's a, it's it's an amazing career. Frank, let me tell you right now, I hope you never need one. But if you yeah. do, they're freaking angels and they will make yeah. the entire world seem much better than it is. Yeah, I had not heard of it. Uh, and it's kind of maybe one of those things where it's not a bad thing that I haven't heard of it, it personally. It's a good you know, thing. yeah, it's yeah. a good thing. It's kind of like social work. You don't want to ever know a social worker. You don't <laughs> right. want to ever know a child life specialist. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you are, Karen. I mean, you are a social worker. You're a private yeah. bereavement specialist now right. because of all of the things that you went on to learn and study and then just put into practice over those years of your life. Can I ask you a question? Well, let's just stay on your brother for just a second. Sure. Uh, knowing what you know now about this whole event, and then, Frank, I want you to kind of probe, probe a little bit too, but how do you believe – that experience at that young age went on to impact you in your life? You know, I, I don't, it's a really, it's a great question. And it's also a really tough question because our lives are full of so many moments. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously I think I, I just gravitated towards that's part of that family story. That was family noir for us. Um, my mom went on to subsequently have another child, my younger sister, who's still with us, and she's a social worker, and she's fantastic and probably would never have been born if Andrew didn't die. So, you know, life as you get older is funny that way. Um, but I think that I learned early on that, you know, shit happens and some really bad stuff happens to families. And, you know, you can either kind of head on you know, deal with it, help people deal with it um, or not. And I always just gravitated towards helping people with it. And so when the job as, as child life went in to, to, you know, look at that and hospitalize children, that was a way to help people. And some of those children did die and, you know, a lot did not. But I was OK with the kids that were really sick and dying because um, I think I knew that that does happen and it didn't scare me. Um, cause my family survived it. Does that make sense? <laughs> makes sense to me, Frank. What do you want to add on to that? I'm um, going to try. You can charge me, Frank, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious if you remember, and you may, maybe you don't remember the exact words were, that were used, but do you remember how death was explained to you at nearly five years old, because I, I think a lot of people, a lot of parents probably struggle with how, you know, even if you just lose a, a, a grant, you know, their child loses a grandparent, which sad, but more of a kind of a normal thing life that's going to happen in a, in a kid's life. And even then, I think a lot of parents struggle with how to explain, you know, what death is and what happens after. How was it explained to you at five? Well, it's funny what, you know, what you remember, my mom's still alive. She's 93 and she's amazing. Oh. So I can talk to her about these things and we do talk about it. Um, and so, you know, memory is a funny thing to what you really remember, what you see. But um, my parents were very open about it to the point where at the funeral, and I do remember bits of this, we, uh, the siblings were asked or, you know, if we wanted to put something in Andrew's coffin as a way to say goodbye to him. So, crazy. Now, I don't remember this part. My mom tells it because she thinks it's just family lore. But my mom, I knew Andrew loved bugs. I mean, he was a three-year-old boy, right? So I got a pillbox out and filled it with bugs. 
Whoa. to put in his coffin. And which makes sense in a five-year-old mind because that's what my brother loved and I'm supposed to give him something he <laughs> loves, right? And <laughs> to this day, I don't understand my mother's fortitude of allowing me to do that when probably in her head, she was like, I thought it was going to be a stuffed animal. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I give her credit because she didn't, you know, she didn't slap my hand away. She didn't say, no, that's not appropriate. She knew it came from a place of love and from the place. So she allowed me to do that. Now, she hasn't told me whether she actually went and like took it out. Went before mm. I'm looking, but um, so we, as I said, our family was very open about it. But to your point, Frank, when I went to kindergarten, because he drowned um, in the summer before Mike started kindergarten. And my mom, we went to the teacher and she said, you know, I have to tell you, we had a very a tragic um, incident this summer and we, we lost Karen's brother, Andrew. And I said, yeah, I'm still looking for him. <laughs> because if you're five and you're a concrete thinker, if you lose something, what do you do? You look, look for, for it. it. The other thing that I think is important about that, to your point about how kids understand death is, when I lose something, it also connects with fault. It's mm -hmm. my fault. If I lose my keys, that's my fault. Mm -hmm. So if I've lost my brother, and with a death, like a drowning, there's a lot of guilt that surrounds that, uh, every family member, even at five. My older sister, my siblings were nine and 10, and of course my parents. So how we explain death to children is very important, especially at those ages. And being concrete, being able to say the words death and died. Um, we pass gas. What does it mean to pass, right? Oh, so, you know, grandfather passed. To a young child, that's, you know, we pass the salt. We pass, I mean, what right. does that really mean? So I think you're right. You know, it is those, it is really important. And I've, I've spent, like Jill, I've spent a lot of time with, on, you know, teaching people, talking to families about explaining death. You know, the word death is not a bad word, and we can say it with kindness and love. You know, we don't have to soften it, but I think we often want to, right? Yeah. Well, we want to because it makes it so real, and that's that's what, you know, gets challenging. But let's yeah. stay in this lane for just a second. And Frank, <laughs> I, I want you to bob and weave with me here. But doing the work that you've done for all these years, what – What's some good practices for, for folks? Because, because listen, sadly, somebody is going to die today, t tomorrow, you know, the next day, right? And, and families all over the place are going to go through this process of losing somebody. So what are some good practices from somebody who did this for a living? Me or Frank? Well, I think Oh, you. definitely not me. There's a reason why you're here. <laughs> You're not touching that with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> no. He's asking questions today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, like I said, I think that, you know, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, you know, A, the age of the child, right? So, what a five year old or three year old is going to understand is much different than what an eight, nine or a teen teenager is going to understand. So, where the child is, not just age, but developmentally, of course, children are all sorts of points on the developmental scale. So where they are developmentally, what they can understand um, is key. But I think, you know, honesty is always the best policy. Like I said, the words, you know, death and died, they're not, they're harsh because society's made them harsh, but they are, that's what's happened. Um, so it's kind of like, it's not sleep. I mean, that's the classic, right? They, you're in a coffin, you're laying down and there's like, you know, you kind of, your eyes are closed. And if it is an open casket, they look like they're sleeping. And if, you know, if someone says, oh, you know, grandpa Henry, you know, is sleeping up in heaven, then the child like, well, let's wake him up. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I want to see him. Let's wake him up. So I think it's important to be concrete. And to always start with those those words and, you know, to sleep is your body stopped working. Mm -hmm. Uncle Frank's body stopped working. So he can't breathe anymore. Like and for a young kid, like, you know, you need to breathe to live. That's what makes you move. So you just help them understand concretely and and the finality of it. Um, and I'm not saying these are easy words. They are really difficult, especially if. You know, if it's me and my own father's died, which is my child's grandfather, then I'm grieving 
And I'm trying to, as a grieving person, explain to my child how my father, it's tough, really, really tough. So I'm not, I don't want to seem cavalier at all. It's very hard to do. For for my two cents, I feel like just using the real words is probably best anyway, because there's so many things that can be misconstrued. Like you use, you know, pass as an example before, um, you know, and, and I feel like there have been times where, you know, if there's a really little kid involved, we'll use the word like vacation, right? Like grandpa went on a vacation and he's not coming back. And then all of a sudden the kid is scarred and never wants to go on vacation mm-hmm. because they think vacation means you never come back mm-hmm. um, or sleeping. Right. And now am I mm-hmm. going to develop some kind of sleep problem because mm-hmm. I associate sleep with this dangerous thing that I might not wake up from. Yeah. Um, I feel like just, 99 if not 100 percent of the time you're just better off using the real words because every other word can be misconstrued some other way absolutely i worked with once with a a young boy who's you know that was told god took his father Hmm. and in his mind he thought well i mean does the hand of god come down and take like do do i go outside and he actually developed fears of going outside thinking Mm -hmm. you know i can you just be taken um right so, yeah, words, words matter uh, for okay. sure. Now, obviously, as kids age, you know, they're able to understand more. You know, they're able to kind of the euphemisms they understand. Um, but it's still to me always my personality was just start with the basic truth you know, mm-hmm. um, and be concrete about it. And then you can add, um, you know, Jill and I have. Uh, We've talked a lot together about even how do you explain suicide to children? Um, you know, how do you explain some of the more difficult types of deaths? Um, or how, even how do you explain cancer? How do you explain, you know, these errant cells that destroy a body from the inside? I mean, you know, so it's not easy. Um, but I agree with you, Frank. Like, start simple and concrete and say the words. Absolutely. So now I'm going to ask a really tough follow-up question on the other end of that same exact spectrum. Um, you, and I mean this as a compliment, you talk about death easily like that. Those words flow out of your mouth and it is a topic that you compared to a lot of other people seem to be able to speak about more easily than others. I think for, and we've heard this a lot with suicide, right? Like parents and teaching young kids about suicide. Like I don't want to plant ideas in their head that they've never had. So I don't want to bring it up until they've brought it up. But Mm -hmm. by the time your kid is bringing it up to you, you've kind of missed a boat somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Right. But this idea that I don't uh, almost like, I don't want to make it too common or too, you know, I don't want to put it on the table. Right. Is there, is there any, is there any fear or hesitation of like making people feel too cavalier about death Mm -hmm. and they start interacting with life in a different way because of that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I have, you know, an equally great answer, (laughs) but um, I do think that, you know, there are no secrets if there's children at home. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, children are, always listening. I mean, you know, you think they're just looking at their phones or their tablets or whatever, (laughs) but the reality is children are listening. So they are hearing conversations. They're hearing uh, broadcasts on the TV. They're, you know, they are hearing things. And if something has happened in the house, they're going to hear things. So I think you're right. By the time you come up and ask them, you know, they've already heard it, thinking about it, and are probably Googling stuff that you wish they weren't Googling. <laughs> right. So um, I, you know, you can always come in through the back door in the sense to say, you know, what have you heard about this? Mm. Obviously, you know, something happened in our family. What have you heard? Mm. And and then you, you get to where they're at. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can correct anything, change anything, you know, tell them the truth or what, you know, what really happened or any misconceptions or anything like that. Um, I agree with you. I come from a different perspective because my entire career, I mean, obviously I grew up in a grieving household and I don't mean that like we had a, I had a very normal childhood. I mean, um, you know, it was not that sense, but we did have this event that a lot of families 
you know, we were the only family I knew that had a child die. Mm -hmm. So it did, you know, obviously mark us, but I had a really normal childhood. Um, And in that sense, but I did go on and you're right. I talk about death and grief and suicide and things that pretty openly that probably most people shy away from. Um, But I think there's also a way to do it. That's very loving and open and, you know, these things are with us. Yeah. So we have to be able to talk about it. Um, and I know uh, it's we could go into that long tangent and Jill's been on the show. And unfortunately, you know, suicides are getting younger and younger. And as I get older and older, it's just it's it's just heartbreaking and mind boggling to me. Um, but it, it's you know, it is something we need to talk about and kids need to be able to talk about. So I have a question uh, and to kind of turn the corner just a little bit in your journey, uh, Karen, but it's okay. So then there becomes this moment in your life where you're faced with something quite scary and uh, you develop this this rare disease. (laughs) And now you're faced with some of this stuff that you've been instructing people on for years where you as loving and as kind and as graceful (laughs) with yourself (laughs) In this process, as you were the people that you served all those years. Oh, wow. Well, wow, talk about you just want to get right in there, don't you, man? Let's go. <laughs> um, I, I tried. I think that one thing that I did was um, I'm a bit of not a control freak, but I, I do like a certain amount of control. And when you're diagnosed with cancer, it certainly feel, or even, not even the diagnosis, it was probably the months leading up to it, um, where there was a lot of unknowns and a lot of fears, and I was in pain. So you just don't know where this is going. And um, those probably were more difficult times than the actual diagnosis. Because once I was diagnosed, I was like, okay, all right, it's named, let's, we can figure this out. Um, so I tried to be kind to myself. I tried to show up for myself. Um, but more importantly, which was harder for me was I tried to let others in because I was, I was kind of, I wanted to control the narrative. It was kind of, besides my immediate family, um, it was hard to let people in. And I soon learned that I could not do this without letting people in. Um, and that's part of the connective part of the compartmentalization that I learned was you have to be connected to yourself, um, to reality, but also to others. So you can't compartmentalize to the point that you're, you know, it's it's building fences, not walls, if that okay. makes sense. And we're going to spend some we're going to spend a good amount of time talking about this connective compartmentalization in just yeah. a second. But I have a question for the doc and red and you in the middle too, Karen here in just a sec. But like uh, when you guys are going through your own like shit in your personal lives, do you find yourselves like wanting to be your own therapist? And are you guys like hyping yourselves up with all the tools that you talk to other people about? Like, I just wonder if you're kicking it around and Frank, you go first. I like you have a fight with you with Michelle and like, and then you go on a drive and, and like, are you working it out like a shrink and going and then you go home and you go, I'm, yeah, I mess it all up or whatever that is. First of all, we never fight. We are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know. You're gonna have to come up with a different example. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. The uh, the short term answer is at least for me in like the immediate whatever. Um, a lot of that shit goes out the window. Just like you know, because the the emotionality of whatever you're involved in like takes over, right? Like all of the the tools and the skills and the responses and all that stuff that you're talking like that's a very intellectual process. And in that moment. Like it's, it's emotion only. Um, For me personally, later, and sometimes later is two minutes later. Sometimes it's a day later, whatever. um, You know, that stuff, blood kind of returns to the brain a little bit. And you start thinking about all the quote unquote, like right or better things to do. Um, And sometimes that results in like beating yourself up more because you're like, ah, like I of all people should have known better, should have handled that better. Um, Sometimes it it really depends on kind of who your uh, your partner is. Um, 
but I've had lots of experiences where, um, you know, I've tried to have some kind of a, a good response. Right. Um, and then that gets dismissed of like, don't psychologist me right now. <laughs> and it's like, this is literally just like a good thing to say. Right. Um, so yeah, it, it adds layers for sure to the entire process. But I think the, the biggest thing, you know, when I'm dealing just something with something like internally, not necessarily a conflict with someone else, but yeah, there's this pressure of like, I should know how to be able to like <laughs> move myself past this moment. Right. And not stay stuck here too long. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, it adds, it adds a layer there. I love that answer more than you could possibly know. Karen, your <laughs> turn, your turn. Same question. Oh, I, I, I resonate with a lot of that, that kind of like, don't therapize me right now. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but, but, but think for a minute. <laughs> um, no, it's and sometimes I get that even with my adult children and, you know, my son will say, I just want you to listen right now. You don't you know, and I was like, oh, my God, I'm not I don't, you're right. Right. I don't have to fix this. Um, but so internally, I stopped working about three years ago. It's not a retire. I say it's like a rewiring Um and I have those moments where, oh, my God, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. What is wrong with me or what, you know, this like and to give yourself some grace and pause, I think, is really hard. Um, whereas if I was working with a client, I would give them all the grace, all the pause in the world to work through what they need to work through. Whereas I don't do that for myself. Um, so someone this weekend said something really great that uh, a mentor said to them, and it was kind of like, does this need to be said? Does this need to be said right now? And does it need to be said by me? <laughs> so I was like, wow, that's great. And how that, you know, we learn as we age to kind of pause, right? Like, okay, what, what would be appropriate right now? What would be most helpful? What would be good? And then as Frank said, I think, and sometimes all that just goes out the goddamn window and <laughs> you're just crying because it's just too much. So right. whatever you know, whatever you think is just out the window and you're completely emoting. Um, and you got to just recognize that that's going to happen in life. I mean, there's there's moments that like can't be solved, right? Like if you get some kind of bad news, that moment can't be solved, right? The best thing that you can do is just kind of give yourself some time to process and not you know, I don't know, go do meth, right? Like in that moment, you're just trying not to like That's make the choice, it worse. Frank. <laughs> <laughs> that, we've, well, I we've don't been, know. We've been I doing learn for people who lived it for almost three years and meth just, is, the, just is what comes. Just don't do meth. Just don't do meth. Is it something, do, do, is there something about me or something about Karen that made you think about meth? I mean. Well. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to answer any of that. <laughs> yeah. I think so anyways, personality, back to doing you know, math. Back to doing math. Yeah. Personality is such a big factor. When someone, uh, people always ask me, like, what's the number one factor to how children are going to grieve or how whatever? And personality is the number one thing, right? How we respond to something, our first kind of go at it. Um, and as I said earlier, I was kind of taught to be a fighter or that was the narrative. And in my life, there's been some funny incidences where my instinct is to do the absolute opposite of what you're supposed to do. Um, for instance, I think I was in third or fourth grade. We're running around the neighborhood and there was a flasher, like a literal old school in a trench coat flasher <laughs> that comes up to us. And we're like playing kick the can or something. Right. And we look at this guy and I'm just like, I look at him and I'm like, what? And I, we start, let's get him. And so we start chasing him. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, it's like, like, Cause I, I guess that's what you're supposed to do. And the poor guy is just, you know, scared and he takes off and, you know, and we just chase this guy for a while. Then we give up because whatever. And I get home and my mother of course is mortified, calls the police. He ends up getting picked up and she's just looking at me. She's like, what were you thinking? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I don't know. It, it looked kind of funny. I'd never seen a penis before. It looked funny. So let's you know, <laughs> we just chased him. <laughs> you know? So how you, how you initially respond to something, right? Like, 
And even, even, uh, even going back to my cancer diagnosis, like when we finally got it, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't mad. I wasn't, you know, I, I had just this odd kind of like, okay, it's my turn now. Like, was that the math? Yeah, it was the math. <laughs> that was the math. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out who was talking here. All right. Yeah, but I can imagine that you have a really good, strong sense about it. I mean, for we, we didn't really announce this up front, but you worked in hospice for many years. And so you, mm-hmm. you've been around that scene enough to where, as Frank said earlier, you're really comfortable talking about it, which means you're really comfortable being around it. And and so I'm going to guess that because of that early incident with your brother, I mean, you've visited your own death in your in your mind, and you've thought about, you know, what what is that going to be for me? And so, when you do that, it's not as scary. Like dying doesn't get as scary. And I'm saying that as a man who's imagined my own death, right in in that sequence. And Frank, I don't know if you have, but get to it. Um, but th- <laughs> don't, don't do it on th- meth, though. Don't, don't do, do it on meth. meth. Don't do it on mouth. That's a bad combination. Best advice we've had on this podcast so far. Um, but, but is that true for you, Karen? Did you have you visited, you know, your own potential death and, and then in so come to peace yeah. with it? Yes, I, I think so. But the reality is, you know, it's never what you really imagine. And the more I worked in bereavement and hospice, I think my fears started to send around my own children and my husband. So, you know, if you you work with a lot with parents who have had a child die or, you know, uh, spouses that have died, it was hard not to take that home and be, oh, my God, what would Nate's death look like or what would that look like for me or my children? Um, I think I processed enough for myself. um, And that's where I came up with the mantra that it's not my story today. Like that got me through it, like whatever the clients were bringing to me. It wasn't my story today. And the today part is important because you have to recognize when it comes to illness or death, at some point, it may be your story, most definitely. So, you know, the now part or the today part is important. And then when when I was sick and looking at, you know, okay, this could potentially kill me, um, you know, what, wow, what is that? feel like. Um, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Um, but it also, you, I don't know. I think that because of you, to your point, I've been living in it for so long professionally, I wasn't really scared of it. Um, it was harder to absorb my family's reaction or my children's. And since my daughter's a ho- um, an oncology nurse, you know, that all of a sudden her mom had what she was giving patients. And so, you know, um, you'd have to ask her, but it, it got messy in that sense um, for a while there. Now, when the chemo and the treatments were working and we kind of things were getting, at least we knew we had a handle on stuff, then you ride a wave, right? You're like, okay, I'm not dying today. Um, right now this is working and we're just going to go with the working part. But yeah, there's some really bad days for sure. How strange is that to have your daughter studying like that had to, did she know too much sometimes? Oh no, it wasn't strange for me. It was beautiful. I mean, she, she, <laughs> yeah, she knew my a lot. midnight nurse. I mean, yeah. I, and she rode the line beautifully. Um, she was able to be my daughter, but also at times I'd be like, Maddie, am I having a reaction from the, you know, the chemo or what is this? And she'd be like, well, let me tell you, you know, um, <laughs> so no, for me, it worked beautifully for her. I, Probably not so beautiful. I think it was really tough. Um, but you'll have to invite her on and ask her. <laughs> it would be very interesting to get her perspective on. I always think about that when we're doing interviews like this. I'm like, you know, it'd be so great right now if we like, well, she's right here right now. And we bring her right in. And, <laughs> yeah, 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 right. And we get to ask her all of the questions that, that we want to. So back to um, connective compartmentalization. Okay. This is a, this is a strategy that you utilize you utilized uh, mm-hmm. throughout your cancer diagnosis. Um, how and and then also I think it's important for you to kind of articulate what you said to us before we started recording, which is this does tend to get a bad rap. 
Yeah, so, I mean, and it's not, uh, the connected compartmentalization is something I just made up. I mean, it's it's a thing that, you know, I, I put together. So I don't know if it, it's out there anywhere. Um, it is now. His, and, and Frank can talk about this probably better than I can in the sense that compartmentalization historically as a coping mechanism always didn't get the best rap because it was closely tied to denial. Yeah. Right. So if you're compartmentalizing to the point that you're actually denying the problem that's in front of you or you're kind of, um, you know, what's the right word? Uh, I can't think of the right word right now, but it's, you know, not always uh, the positive coping that I I used it for. Um, and what I like to think of is like a mental boundary. But again, as I said, it's more of a fence and not a wall. You start to create walls, then you're creating a disconnect and a denial. I think of it in my head as more of a fence. So I can see through it. I can see the issue on the other side. Now, whether I hop the fence or open the gate, that's up to me. But I'm never denying that it's there. So, um, and it's hard to deny cancer when you're in the middle of treatment because at times you just feel so crappy. It's like reality is always, you're carrying it with you all the time. But there were days when I felt good that I shut that gate. I was like, I don't, you know, I don't want to look at it right now. I actually feel okay. I know it's there. I can see it in the gate. But man, I do not want to, I don't want to go there. I want to enjoy what I have. So I used mantras, um, as I talked about before. But I had to change my mantra because it was my story now. Um, So what, you know, and it gets a lot of press, but that kind of mindfulness, that being present became very important. So if I'm at a dinner party and I'm feeling, you know, kind of crappy, I have to think like, okay, where do I want to be right now? Do I want to be here at this dinner party with my friends? Or do I want to be within myself feeling crappy thinking about the cancer? So I had to like, make the, the mental effort to be like, nope, I'm going to be right here. And just kind of go back, oh, I want, I'm going to be right here uh, for now. So that kind of those kind of mantras that help you stay connected, but compartmentalize as well. And to be fair, I think there's a lot of people that use this every day of their lives because they have to. If I was a single mother and I have cancer and I've got two small kids, I have to compartmentalize, right? Especially if my job, that's the only way I get my health care insurance, the only way that I can get my treatment. I don't have the luxury of sitting around and, you know, just being miserable myself. I got to go to work. I have to compartmentalize. I've got to do this. So I think people do it all the time and they may not realize they're doing it. Um, Frank, I see you shaking your head a ton here. What do you want to add? For me, the, the words that I always, and I think you, you use the exact word like right now, um, Mm -hmm. this, this, like, if you take something that you don't want to look at and you lock it away in a box and shove it in a corner, that is technically compartmentalizing. You are putting Mm -hmm. it in a compartment, like it's putting it in the attic or the garage Mm -hmm. where it's going to die and pretending like it's not there anymore. Uh, As opposed to, you know, I'm at work right now. I can, I can think about this more. I can deal with this other thing more later after work, but right now this is kind of what I need to be doing. Um, and even kind of like telling yourself, right? Like once work is over and I can get in my car, like I can be sad then, right? Like I can't be sad now, but I can be sad in three hours. Um, but three hours, right? Not like three months, Mm because if you keep it locked away for three months, like no bueno. Um, so for me, the, the, the phrase that I always use is right now, like, what am I focusing on right now? And what's going to wait until just a little bit later? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, even working with the bereaved, I worked with a lot of parents that, you know, their spouse died and they're trying to raise their kids by themselves now. Um, you know, be like, there's, you know, I think every single person, man or female, told me the showers where they fell apart, mm-hmm. you know, because the kids usually didn't interrupt in the shower. Sometimes they did, but they usually <laughs> didn't. It was their time and they would just lose it in mm-hmm. the shower. And whether it just was their tears got mixed with the shower or whatever it felt, and then they could kind of pull themselves together. And I would say, you know what? That's a beautiful thing. That's okay. Mm -hmm. That's because you allowed yourself to do what you needed to do. You know, you might have to say, I can't do it now, but I can fall apart in the shower later. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the the timing and, and 
I, being present at different times does matter. And sometimes you have to really literally tell yourself. Yeah. You know? But I so, think you'd agree. Like if you, if you never fell apart, that'd be weird. Right. 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 What do those pep talks sound like in the moment? Because that would be helpful for somebody who's, you know, going through something like this themselves right now and needs a, a tip or a strategy or some thing because, they, you know, maybe they said, yeah, damn, I'd love to be out, but I do go out and then I just feel like being home. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, what, what, what do those pep talks sound like? Well, you know, it's such a personal thing. I mean, I guess when I worked with people, I worked with them on finding like what sounds true to you, because I can't give somebody to say, OK, say this. But they're like, oh, my God, I'd never say that. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's not their voice. It's not their voice. It would be that's that Karen that told me to say that. So that's not working <laughs> for me. Um, it's really about living, you know, for the while you're fighting for the life you want to live. Right. So you're, you're you're trying to live while you're fighting for your life. And what does that look like? So and I don't mean just cancer. It could be anything. Right. Any high stressors. If you're in the midst of a divorce, you know, your husband just died, whatever those major stressors are, you know, how am I going to live while I'm fighting for the life I want? Um, and so whatever those mantras are, I would always, like Frank said, add the, you know, add the time element. Add the now, add the, where do I want to be right now? And sometimes I would do that. And if I was somewhere that I really wanted to be at home in bed, I would listen to myself and say, you know what? Really now I really need to be home in bed. And I would make that happen. Or I'd ask someone, which was really hard for me to say, I need to go now. (laughs) Um, But sometimes it'd be like, no, I want to be here. I want to be here. And so I just had to tell myself, then be here, then be here right now. So that, that mantra for me worked. Um, I would just tell people, start listing things, you know, that feel right in your head to you. I don't know, Frank, if you would do something different or have a better. No, I mean, there's a couple of things that I I think I say to myself sometimes that probably apply to this situation. One, and it's not it's not mine, but, you know, be where your feet are. Right. Mm -hmm. So just kind of this reminder that wherever I am or whoever's in front of me, like, let's, let's give that the attention, right. Mindfulness being present, all, all those things, Mm -hmm. but that reminder of like, be where your feet are. And then later, like you said, in, in the, in the shower or whatever, like that can be the time where there's no one else in front of me that needs my attention. So I can, I can let my mind go to other places. Um, another thing that I, I use for myself sometimes is like this, this reminder that I can do hard things, Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that, that, I guess that's my version of a, of a pep talk, like, Mm -hmm. because all these things that we're talking about, even though they make sense, they're not easy to do. So, uh, I use that one a lot that like, I can do, I can do hard things, um, whether I'm right or not, I don't know, but I believe it in the moment. So it's fine. Yeah. I do a lot of yoga and yoga. They, you know, they talk about like, I get to. Mm. And sometimes you feel like, eh, you know, like, <laughs> I don't want to, and it doesn't feel like I get to, but sometimes turning something on its head to say, you know what, I get, I get to be here. I get to do this. Yeah. Um, and for me, even like while I was sick, if I was out, that helped me because it's like right now I get to do this. And that's pretty cool given what I'm dealing with. Yeah. So those kind of small reminders can help too. I've used, I've used that one. Oh, I use it. I use it jokingly sometimes, but I, I can remember one time in particular. So I used to coach um, high school softball. Um, so, you know, a bunch of 14, 15, 16 year old girls. And um, I remember one time in particular, there was a girl who was like walking up to practice and she was on her phone and she was like, you know, I got to go. I got to go to practice now. And she hung up and I was like, you have to go to practice. You got to go. No, you get to go to practice right now. Right. Like we had tryouts a week ago. There are girls who wanted to be here who don't get to be here. Like you get right. to go to practice right now. Um, so I used it kind of like seriously in that moment, but there's plenty of times where, um, you know, I've used it jokingly too, but it, it's yeah. something that pops into my head. This, this idea that, you know, we, we get to do things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How are things going for you right now? And how are you, how's your health? 
help me. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's great. I, uh, Friday I had scans and blood work and they've given me a get out of jail pass for another four months. So, um, so far I'm in good health. The, the cancer I had is a rare appendix cancer, which, and I was fortunate. I was at the Mayo Clinic, uh, not to give huge plugs, but I had a great experience there. Um, but even there, they didn't know it was, even after they opened me up and took everything out, they still didn't know what it was until the you know, the bio, um, the biopsies came back. So it's just one of those very strange cancers that nobody really looks out for. Um, and they don't know why. So, you know, then that's where I'm kind of like, you know, shit happens. It can happen to anyone at any time. And, you know, nobody, nobody gets a pass. So um, sometimes it feels like that. But the reality is, I think th things always can just happen. Um, yeah. but, you know, we, we, we asked Rami this question um, w with regard to her cancer. And the question uh, I, I can ask it for you, given given what we are understanding now about the mind body connection to pain and disease and about, you know, living, let's call it a cancerous life could lead to real cancer, that kind of was there anything, was there any thread or are you truly one of those <laughs> shit happens cases where, you know, some cells met some other cells and they made a baby that didn't, you know, is it like? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, not a big drug user. Not, haven't, You know, I mean, I was kind of a bad teenager, but not, you know, not that bad. I lived a fairly clean life um, and not a lot of history of cancer in our family at all, surprisingly. Yeah. So. You know, and most people that know me know that I've, I exercise all the time. You know, they were just like, they were floored. Like, they couldn't believe it. I, you know, I think because I work with it so much, I wasn't surprised because I see it. But yeah. a lot of people just didn't believe me, um, <laughs> which was fine. But um, so, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, it's the million dollar question. Nobody knows. And even the, you know, the docs don't know. Even the genetic. It's just one of those, you know errant cells that just got happy um maybe so it I, was the math maybe it was the math <laughs> it's you don't know all right you know, i kind of wish because then i would have something that like you know i i you know i was like what was it was after covid i was like did i drink too much during covid did i have like too many cocktails was that it like you know and i didn't I actually i never got covid so i can't even link it to you know, I, th we just don't know what to link it to. So sure. Yeah. One too well, many margaritas. <laughs> that's fine. And, and, and just to kind of like tie a bow around your idea of connective compartmentalization, because you used it for cancer and you used it mm -hmm. to get through a real serious situation in your life. Maybe you could illustrate how other people could use that same philosophy for other difficult things in their life. So again, I think it's, it's, you know, it is, well, it's like anything else. It's a tool. And, you know, as a coping tool, things can be used for good or for evil. A hammer can build something or tear it down. Right. So, um, as I said earlier, whether I think it works best, I don't know, it's a good question on minor stresses, but I've only kind of thought about it with major stresses. Um, and I've linked it to myself on fears. So fears are always there. And it's not about you know, getting rid of the fear, it's about managing the fear. So, you know, how do we manage fears? And whether your fear is based on, I'm getting a divorce and now I'm gonna be on my own, you know, your fear is, whatever your fear is, there's, you know, we have to learn how to manage it. So I think compartmentalization and the connected part can help you manage fears, um, but kind of putting them in their place, being able to look at them, have some mantras, have some ways, to kind of face them, I guess, um, without getting suffocated or consumed by them. You know, when we're consumed by fear, right, it's fight, flight, or freeze. We become um, incapable of moving in the best way. So it's kind of being able to help us process it in a healthy way. Maybe that's a circular, is that a circular answer enough for you? <laughs> um, but, you know, because again, I, I would have to get, I would, you know, like a specific example, because I think you can apply it to just about anything. Um, if there's something really difficult in front of you um, that's got you a little bit paralyzed or really paralyzed, say, okay, how can I take it apart and look at it, compartmentalize it and put it somewhere where then I can actually deal with it? 
instead of having it smother me, um, if that makes sense. So for me, I'm, you know, I was brought up in kind of also an, uh, an academic household. So I took the cancer and I had to learn about it. That's where, you know, that helped me control it a bit, right? So to just give you an example. So I was like, okay, I can't let this fear of dying, this fear of this illness, I gotta, I'm going to learn about it first. And then maybe I'll learn how to attack it and how to deal with it, or even the vernacular with dealing with the doctors. Um, and I journaled. That was another thing that was new to me. Um, I told a lot of people to journal over the years <laughs> and never picked up a pen myself um, until I got cancer. So, you know, I and that actually did help. And now when I go back and read it, um, it's amazing to look at where I was. So, you know, that journaling also allowed me to put it behind that fence um, that it was still there and I could pull out that journal and look at it again. Um, I don't even know if that answers your question. No, it does. It does. (laughs) And my last question, then Frank, I'll give you the floor to close things up. But how, how did going through that, a cancer diagnosis make you better in your professional life, maybe more than anything because of the line of work that you're in? Well, I don't, I haven't put it to the test because when I got cancer, I wasn't working and I haven't gone back to work in that realm right now. I'm doing other things. Um, But if it's, you know, I do think that I have greater empathy in the sense that it's not just, um, I've been in hospitals, a lot of hospitals when I was working, but I never was sitting in the treatment chair or the infusion chair. Um, so I can't help but have a much more visceral empathy um, for those that are doing that or the fear before you're diagnosed of what you're dealing with. Um, so I think that I have, I have greater empathy and, and better years uh, for just, you know what, like just listen. Um, just listen to other people and what they're, what they're going through. Dr. Showing Frank up. Pavacqua, what do you got, man? Uh, well, I was actually going to ask a question that I think she just kind of answered right now. It was going to be, you know, to, to share some advice with folks. And, and how many times have we heard this from, you know, from guests before? Sometimes you don't know what to say, but you can be there and you can listen. Right. And I think that's a that's a perfect showing. Kind of, showing up is huge. Showing yeah. up is huge. I mean, I can't I can't say that enough. Um, I should have it tattooed. Um, it, you know, it's just, and it, it means it, sometimes it just means sitting there. It doesn't mean you have to be doing your dishes or it doesn't have to mean anything except just show up. And it just might be a quick text or a quick phone call or, and the more people that show up for someone creates a net that you feel like you'll be, you'll be safer in. Um, yeah, there's, and I, I'm, you know, I can't even, I, what I learned, which, uh, is that I was so supported. Um, and it's humbling. Uh, it's very humbling and it was hard to accept sometimes, um, and allow people to show up for me. But, uh, it was, um, in the end, I think that's what I learned was to allow people to show up for me. Um, and what I gained so much more out of that than probably they even know, but it was, um, that's the upside of down, I guess. It is the upside and down. <clears throat> well, guys, thank you so much for a great conversation today. This is uh, this has really been helpful for me, and uh, I'll put a shameless plug in for an event that we've got coming up on October 14th, which is a grief relief event that myself, uh, Teresa, a good friend of ours, Jill McMahon, and this guy named Rob, who does equine therapy, are putting on up in uh, Scottsdale. We're going to call it the Grief Relief Retreat. Okay. And it's, it's actually given me some even deeper insights to how we might serve that group of people when we get to spend some time with them. So I really do appreciate it. Oh, it's been great. Well, it's nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet Thanks you, for, too. Yeah, thanks for coming. Absolutely. Dr. Thanks Frank, me. have a great afternoon yourself, buddy. Hey, good Likewise. luck. Good luck with the, uh, the baby. Oh, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> He's going to need it. Yeah. We have three goals with Learn From People Who Lived It. One, to help you feel less alone. Two, encourage you to seek out a coach, a therapist, a church, anyone who can help you get through your journey and find some healing. Three, when you're ready, share your story with us. Find Learn From People Who Lived It 
wherever you get podcast. Search it using all one word. Learn from people who lived it. One of our proud resource partners is Eric's House. Here's the deal. Nothing quite prepares us for the heartache of a profound loss. And grief isn't a problem to be fixed, but rather a normal reaction to loss. So when somebody you love dies, it might feel like everything you once knew is true has changed. When we experience that loss, especially the ones that are really unexpected, like suicide or addiction, grief is complicated. That's where the community at Eric's House comes in. Link to them on the resources page at learnfrompeoplewholivedit.com.